Tonight, the dramatic images coming in. Entire towns underwater on the west coast after nearly a foot and a half of rain. Dangerous flash flooding. Winds gusting more than 90 miles per hour. Hundreds of people forced from their homes. Tonight, that system is moving east. Late developments in the Kyle Rittenhouse case, the jury moves toward a decision. Wisconsin's governor activating 500 members of the National Guard to help support police in case of possible protests following the verdict. Terry Moran standing by in Kenosha. The major headline on boosters, the FDA considers opening the door for all adults 18 and older to be able to get Moderna and Pfizer boosters as soon as this week. This comes as COVID cases continue to surge as the temperatures drop. Tonight, the debate over an issue that could drive a wedge between American bishops and the Pope. The public wants to weigh in on a very personal battle over whether President Biden should keep receiving communion. Tonight, a debate over migrants in the European Union now playing out for the world to see. Belarus accused of putting hundreds of desperate migrants in an untenable situation, luring them to Belarus, then pushing them to go into Poland. An Iraqi man tells ABC News tonight, Belarusian security forces pressured migrants to attack the Polish guards, and guards punched and kicked him, asking why he wasn't fighting. Polish forces fighting back with tear gas and water cannons. The story we first brought you on Prime earlier this fall now escalating. Ian Panel is at the Polish border tonight to help explain this complex situation. Unlocking the power of the sea. Some of the world's choppiest waters are a massive source of untapped renewable energy. We visit one of the world's biggest experimental labs for tidal energy off the Scottish coast. Right now behind us is generating enough power to power 2,000 homes. Yep, as we speak. While he is retired, former NBA star Dwayne Wade has a new book out today telling us he's just getting started. I'm working on a lot of different things and it's all exciting for me, but it's all new. And so I'm starting from the bottom in a sense and I'm in my early stages. I'm in my rookie year again. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with a push for boosters for all American adults in an effort to help slow what is starting to become a fall and winter surge. Late today, we learned the FDA could authorize booster shots for those 18 and older as soon as Friday. Many are pushing for this decision, and as we've reported all week, some states are not even waiting. At least seven have already made boosters available for all adults. Officials there trying to avoid scenes like this, a Connecticut nursing home where virtually all the residents were vaccinated, and yet they're now dealing with a COVID outbreak. 89 cases and sadly, eight deaths. And tonight, Pfizer is asking the FDA to authorize its antiviral pill to treat people sick with COVID-19. It's the second COVID pill. The FDA is already considering a similar drug from Merck. Stephanie Ramos leads us off tonight from New York. Tonight, we're learning the FDA is planning to authorize Pfizer booster shots for all adults by Friday. A CDC panel is now scheduled to meet at the end of the week with a new wave of vaccines going into arms as soon as this weekend. To slow a winter surge, a growing number of states have already gotten ahead of CDC guidelines and made boosters available to all adults. But even in those states, some people say the mixed messages haven't made it easy to book a shot. They're like, yeah, we don't care what Santa Clara County says. We only care what the CDC says. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm a very honest person. Some health experts say the patchwork booster rollout isn't working. Frankly, the CDC and FDA have made a major strategic mistake. They have made the booster guidance so confusing that people don't know who should be getting a booster and who shouldn't be. But in New York, where boosters are now open to all adults, a hopeful sign. <laughs> This New Year's Eve, Times Square will once again welcome back crowds who can show proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test. And tonight, Pfizer is formally asking the FDA to authorize its new antiviral pill after early trial results showed it cut the risk of hospitalization or death by 89%. Unlike monoclonal antibody treatments, which are given through an IV, the Pfizer pills, Paxlovid, can be taken at home for five days after testing positive. Another antiviral pill from Merck could be authorized first by the end of the year. Vaccine still is our best weapon, but these pills are that second line of defense, and that will be important to millions of people. So many health officials now advocating for people to get those booster shots. Stephanie joins us now. Stephanie, I want to get back to the booster shots for all adults. We know that the FDA has been weighing a request from Pfizer, but do we know if they plan on extending that for Moderna as well? 
Well, Lindsay, tonight we've learned that the FDA could green light the Moderna boosters at the same time as Pfizer's. A government official tells us both options are on the table and we could see these vaccines after the CDC panel makes its recommendations this Friday. Lindsay. Stephanie Ramos, thanks so much. Next to those jury deliberations in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, 12 people, among them one person of color, will decide whether Rittenhouse acted in self-defense when he opened fire on three people, killing two of them during protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And Kenosha is where we find Terry Moran, who's on the ground, as the jury reviews the evidence. In the courtroom in Kenosha today, a striking moment. Kyle Rittenhouse facing life in prison if he's convicted on the most serious charge, drawing the numbers himself at random, determining which of the 18 jurors who watched the entire trial will decide his fate. Number nine and number 52. In the end, those jurors, seven women and five men. One of the 12 is a person of color. Rittenhouse faces five felony charges from first degree intentional homicide, the most serious charge, to reckless endangerment. So the jury must look at each of the three shootings, two of them deadly, Rittenhouse committed that night last year. Each one captured on videotape and testified to by witnesses. I thought that the defendant was um, an active shooter. This case carrying unmistakable political overtones, those protests sparked by a police shooting and the defense clearly trying to put the protesters themselves on trial. The rioters, the demonstrators who turned into rioters, those are the individuals who bring us forth. They were pushing, firing dumpsters, destroying property. Everything this community went through, the only person who shot and killed anyone was the defendant. Yes, there was property damage. No one's here to defend that. You cannot claim self-defense against a danger you create. This small city still traumatized by that night. The local sheriff today issuing a statement saying he sees no reason for curfews or road closures and Wisconsin's governor urging people to remain peaceful. Terry Moran joins us now live from Kenosha where the judge just sent the jury home for the day. Terry, that drawing of juror numbers, that, that seems highly unusual. Well, often jurors have to be separated at the end of a case, but it's usually a court clerk or the judge, him or herself, who's drawing the numbers. Uh, but this judge, Judge Schroeder, uh, he has his own ways of doing things. And he said tonight, in response to a lot of people asking about it, he says this has been his established practice for more than 20 years. Uh, there was some concern that perhaps it connected the defendant to the jury in a way that might bias the case one way or another. But it may also just be a way to remind all the jurors that the defendant defendant remains innocent, he remains part of the community at this point, whatever, it's how Judge Schroeder does it. Uh, also today the jurors asked for more copies of the instructions. Are we able to read any tea leaves as far as what that might mean? Well, it's hard to read juries, of course, but uh, one thing that, that they did is they asked for those jury's instructions, a uh, copy for each one of the jurors, in two different uh, ways. First, they asked for the f opening pages of them, the first six pages. Those are the pages that describe and explain the law of self-defense and of provocation. A defendant gives up the right to claim self-defense if they provoke the attack. That's what they wanted to zero in on. Then they wanted to read all the charges and all the rest of the jury instructions. Uh, one thing you can say about it, it's clear they're being methodical. They all want their own copy of the law, and that's as it should be. Most jurors approach things you know, pretty seriously. It looks like this juror does this this jury does as well they've been dismissed for the night after about eight and a half hours of going over this case they'll be back at it in the morning and, and terry saw footage of a lot of people crowding outside of the courthouse today with varying signs give us a sense of the mood there in kenosha tonight you know, there are there is that knot, I would call it a knot of protesters, and they are loud uh, in front of the courthouse. There aren't that many of them, though. Really, this does not feel like a, a city on edge at all. Last year was a traumatizing event, event for Kenosha. But uh, I walked around the, the, the town today, up and down the streets, visiting various businesses, talking to people. Uh, they aren't boarding up their windows, as they did last year after the first night. Uh, they do not feel that this time uh, this city is going to you know, go up in flames. Of course, uh, no one knows because a lot of people could come from outside. But this town, Kenosha right now, it does not feel like things are going to get out of hand. Lindsay? Terry Moran, our thanks to you.
Now to the trial of three Georgia men in the death of Ahmad Arbery. The prosecution has rested its case after eight days of testimony. Today, the jurors heard from a forensic pathologist and saw grisly photos of Arbery's autopsy. They heard that any one of the three gunshot wounds could have been fatal. Here's ABC's Steve Osinsani. The pictures were too much for Ahmad Arbery's mother, who is seen here looking down as a medical examiner showed jurors how her son was shot to death on this street in South Georgia. The pathologist described a brutal killing, sharing this disturbing photo of what was a white T-shirt that Arbery was wearing and testifying that between five and 10 of his ribs were broken in the gunfire in February of last year. What was Ahmad Arbery's cause of death? Ahmad Arbery died of multiple shotgun wounds. The three white men charged with his murder have pled not guilty, saying they were making a citizen's arrest under then Georgia law, even though their suspicions that Arbery was a thief have never been confirmed by police or surveillance videos from a neighborhood construction site. Lawyers for Travis McMichael, who fired the fatal shot, are arguing that Arbery was killed because, in their view, he tried to grab McMichael's gun. Is it consistent with the wrist wound? For Mr. Arbery to have grabbed the gun and the gun been pulled back by Mr. McMichael when it was fired. It, that's possible. Steve Osinsami on the case for us once again. Steve, now that the prosecution has rested, what can we expect from the defense, particularly with lawyers defending three different men? So there are three sets of lawyers, and we expect to hear their defense, their defense being mounted starting tomorrow morning. You know, they're going to describe a neighborhood where there were people who were concerned about crime, not just their clients. But one of the questions is how they're going to address concerns that the reason why this victim was seen as suspicious is because he was black. A few things they're going to be arguing. They're going to argue that this was a result of a suspicious uh, burglar that they had in the neighborhood. They're also going to say that they just wanted the victim to stop and talk to them. That does beg the question, however, is to whether they would have expected him to stop if he were black. And that's, that's one of the underlying issues here. Also, this other issue that we're hearing in the trial in Wisconsin, who was the one who was chasing whom? In this instance, it was the defendants who were chasing the victim. But they're going to argue that all they wanted was him to stop, wait for police, ask questions, figure out what was going on. Lindsay? All right. Steve Osen, Sami, thanks so much for your coverage as always. For more on both the Kyle Rittenhouse as well as the Ahmad Arbery trials, we welcome back ABC News contributor Shauna Lloyd, an attorney with the Cochrane firm. Thank you so much as always for joining us, Shauna. The jurors in the Rittenhouse trial will start there. They asked for more copies of the instructions, which we know are lengthy. What else might we be hearing from these 12 individuals as deliberations continue? Well, Lindsay, the fact that they even asked for their own copies means that they're being very careful, thoughtful, and deliberate. They each want to be able to interpret things, possibly make notes about these jury um, instructions. So that tells us a little bit about this, juror, this jury. It also means that what we may hear are more questions about what's in these instructions. We may hear questions for clarification, definitions, different things of that nature. And of course, juries are always unpredictable, so we may hear some other things along the way as well. Do you read anything by the fact that the jurors decided they weren't going to continue deliberating tonight? It sounds like the judge gave them that option, that they could continue working. They wrapped it up. Does that mean that it, potentially that they're not close and so it's like we're going to still need another day tomorrow? Might as well not burn the midnight oil tonight? Typically, what you see when juries decide that they are not going to continue deliberating is that they are not close. It doesn't mean that they might not reach a decision tomorrow, but they recognize that they are far apart at this point. And so they've ended at a proper time today. Everyone's going to go home and they're going to start fresh. And switching gears now to the Arbery trial, what's the significance of the testimony that each of the three bullets could have been fatal? I think that's significant because it shows that no matter how this, the, which shot it was initially, the first shot could have been a fatal shot, which would cause a number of things, involuntary actions. He could not have continued a struggle. He would have been incapacitated a lot of times or anything that happened thereafter was not by his own volition. So I think that that's really significant that these shots, each one would have been a fatal shot. We're now set to hear from the defense in that case. Each of these three men played a unique role in what happened that day. So is it really a tricky balance for these lawyers to protect their individual clients while still presenting a clear picture of what they all collectively say happened? 
Absolutely. I think that there's going to be a, a balance that they have to strike because the story overall for the jury and the defense needs to make sense. If they can't follow it and it's not cohesive amongst the three defendants, I think that you're going to lose a bit of the jury. So there is going to be a real fine line in making sure that they're protecting their individual clients' rights and their theory of the defense and ensuring that it fits within this larger picture. Because other than uh, Mr. Bryant, the other two were kind of acting more in concert and were speaking to each other. He was a little bit different. So I think we will see, and especially with Mr. Golf's history, I think we'll see a little variation when it comes to his theory of the case. Shauna Lloyd, thank you so much as always. Thanks, Lindsay. Now to a state of emergency after an atmospheric river hammered Washington in the Pacific Northwest. In some areas, a foot and a half of rain fell. Several rivers at major flood stage tonight and whole towns now underwater. ABC's Will Carr reports. Tonight, hundreds of families are out of their homes and at least one person is missing. Nearly a foot and a half of rain pummeling parts of Washington state over several days. North of Seattle and Samas, a race to rescue hundreds after the Nooksack River jumped its banks. It's pitch black, the wind's blowing. I mean, I have a 20 foot boat and that current was, you know, yarding it into the telephone poles and stuff like that. Coast Guard helicopters dropping baskets, rescuing a baby and nine more people near the town of Forks. Never since Stephanie Vigil and Eric Walker so trapped bad. in their home oh, with their the dogs. You can do it. Let's go. Come Standing on their furniture, go. pleading for help, finally go. rescued through their window by heavy equipment. We finally got it out, guys. Everson police still searching for a man swept away on Main Street Monday. Storms fueled by 82 mile an hour wind gusts toppling huge trees. Landslides blocking major Interstate 5. Those high winds now fueling wildfires in Colorado. Back here in Washington State, those winds have died down, but we're still in a major flood stage, and you can see those sandbags. We're expecting more rain later this week. Lindsay. Hopefully those sandbags will do the trick. Will, thank you. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z joins us now. Ginger, where is the storm right now? Well, it is right in the middle of the nation. So that cold front still so powerful. We've seen gusts upwards of 74 miles per hour in North Dakota, but it stretches all the way down through the Rockies and into even New Mexico. So Albuquerque had their second day of record high temperatures, but also the wind gusts in the some of those red flag warnings up to 55 miles per hour. And yes, there's warmth ahead of that. But boy, we wish uh, in those areas that it came with a little bit of moisture. And, and Ginger, we know so much of the West has been dealing with this unrelenting mega drought. Ha has there been any improvement with the recent storms? <laughs> Well, there has been some. It's come far too quickly for a lot of folks, as we just saw in some of those images. But I want to take you to the map because this really helps to kind of detail and emphasize what's happened. More than 16 inches of rain in just five days in the areas that you can see targeted there in the northwestern Washington state. That is not the area that needed the rain. If you look at the drought monitor, where they really need it would be in southeastern Washington state. Now look across California, which still has close to 80% in that second highest level of drought. Nevada, big problems in Montana, and still in parts of Utah. So no, the drought certainly hasn't been eradicated, and the rain just keeps falling in the places that already have it. And, and while many might really like the warmer fall temperatures, I understand an unseasonally warm fall is actually affecting the ski season. So Steamboat Springs just announced today that they will be delaying the start of their season. This is the first time they've done it since 2016. Meanwhile, in the Sierra, because we have had those atmospheric rivers, there are some places opening early. So, so for some people that kind of like Hawaiian or Pineapple Express has worked out and for others like in Colorado, it will be delayed. Got it. All right, Ginger Z, thank you so much as always. Next to the tensions that continue to rise between Belarus and Poland, it's a story, as you know, we've been following closely. The EU says a growing migrant crisis is being orchestrated by an authoritarian Belarusian leader, and human rights activists are concerned with how Poland is reacting. Here's ABC's senior foreign correspondent, Ian Panel, tonight. Tonight, tensions erupting along the Poland-Belarus border. Hundreds of desperate migrants reportedly encouraged and some claiming to be forced by Belarusian police to attack Polish border forces. The Poles responding with water cannons. Stun grenades also going off, though it's unclear who detonated them. 
Poland accusing Belarusian police of giving them to the migrants, a sign of how this crisis is escalating. Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko, angry at EU sanctions, is accused of trying to foment a crisis on Europe's doorstep as payback. The EU says his authoritarian regime has for months lured migrants to Belarus, many of them Iraqis and Syrians, with a promise of helping them across the border. This is what the crisis looks like on the ground. A harrowing video given to ABC News by Polish human rights activists showing a Kurdish woman collapse near the border with hypothermia. You can hear her struggling to breathe. She's now in hospital in a serious condition. And some are dying. At a lonely graveyard in the freezing woods near the border, a young Syrian man is buried. A friend says Ahmed al-Hassan drowned because he was forced by Belarusian guards to cross the river to Poland even though he told them he couldn't swim. Ahmed was just 19. So tragic, not just for Ahmed, but for many others like him. Ian Panel joins us now from Poland. Ian, the EU is accusing Lukashenko of creating this crisis in retaliation for the sanctions they've imposed on him. What's the situation at the border right now, and how, is the, this, how has this rocked the EU? Yeah, they certainly have made that accusation. There's a lot of evidence to support it. I mean, the situation right now, I mean, let me just paint the picture. Over the last few weeks, the weather has just got colder and colder. Tonight, it's below zero, and many of these migrants have been stuck outside for days, even weeks. Uh, the temperatures are really cold. They haven't had enough food. They haven't had shelter. People have complained. They haven't been able to sleep properly for days and days. And they're being used as these political pawns in this game. Some of the migrants we've spoken to have said that they have been forced to attack Polish authorities. They've been beaten unless they cooperated with Belarusian police. They've been taken down to the border fence. They've been told to make illegal crossings. In some cases, even having the razor wire cut. Uh, for them. Uh, and of course, the Europeans are looking at this and saying, well, look, if we make way and allow these people through, firstly, it's a victory for Alexander Lukashenko. It allows him uh, to look victorious. And secondly, it sends a precedent to other potential migrants to follow the same route into Minsk, into the border and then on into Europe. So they feel that they have to make a stand, but it's pretty shameful, uh, really, on both sides, because these people are trapped in the middle. They're unwitting victims, if you like, of this policy play between Europe and Belarus, uh, and they're the ones really suffering, and some of them are dying. How is Lukashenko responding to all this? Uh, I mean, he's given a number of interviews. Uh, what he's looking for, I think, is partly some form of diplomatic recognition. He wants an easing of those sanctions, of course. But he had a long conversation with the outgoing German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, the other day. That's the kind of thing that Alexander Lukashenko wants. He doesn't want the kind of diplomatic isolation that he's currently had. He's had four conversations with Vladimir Putin uh, just over the last week. Uh, now, what he says is that you know, he's not the one to blame. And this is an argument you also hear from Vladimir Putin. What they say is that these migrants are coming from countries that have been invaded or interfered with by the West, countries like Afghanistan, uh, countries like Iraq, and that all he's doing is allowing people who want to move to the West, which he says, look, you portray yourselves as this uh, freedom-loving part of the world and they want to come and live there. They're leaving countries that are in crisis because of uh, what you have done on the ground. I'm just allowing them to go through. So he's trying to portray himself as an innocent party in this, but the truth is entirely opposite. And panel, our thanks to you. Back here in the U.S. tonight, President Biden is hitting the road to try to convince Americans that the $1 trillion infrastructure bill he just signed into law is laser focused on their kitchen table concerns. The president in New Hampshire today, just one of more than a thousand events his team is planning in an effort to sell the benefits over the next six weeks. ABC's Rachel Scott reports. Today, President Biden traveling to New Hampshire in an effort to show Americans his new infrastructure law will improve their lives. Despite the cynics, Democrats and Republicans, we can work together. We can deliver real results. The president standing in front of a decrepit bridge that's been marked as dangerous and in need of urgent repair for nearly a decade. 
In New Hampshire alone, there are more than 215 bridges in poor condition. This may not seem like a big bridge, but it saves lives and solves problems. Every mile counts. Every minute counts in an emergency. And folks, this is a bridge that has been structurally deficient for years. The massive infrastructure investment now making front pages across the country. Infrastructure funds on way to Michigan, $10 billion. In Montana, $3 billion for roads, airports, water projects. In Ohio, Bill makes rail line possible. And in New York, no subway fare hikes or service cuts. Funding for new electric vehicle charging stations, broadband internet, and clean water projects now on its way to states. Every American, every child should be able to turn on the faucet and drink clean water. At Wilkins Elementary School in Jackson, Mississippi, help can't come soon enough. The conditions are so dire, students do not have access to working restrooms. They have to leave the classroom and wait in line to use porter potties outside. We should have access to clean running water. We should have access to inside restrooms where our children can go and relieve themselves and not have to go outside into the elements. Is the water at this school safe for students to drink? We don't drink the water. We provide bottled water for our boys and girls. Um, so no ma'am, it is not safe. You know you are in trouble when bottled water is a requirement. Rachel Scott joins us now from outside the Capitol. Rachel, the president is hoping to build more momentum on the heels of this for his domestic agenda. Where do things stand at this point? Yes, Lindsay, that is that $1.75 trillion package. It's a social spending bill with money for universal pre-K, for child care funding to combat climate change. Democratic leadership wants a vote on that bill in the House by the end of the week, but it faces an uphill battle in the Senate. That one moderate holdout, Senator Joe Manchin has concerns over the price tag, about the effects that it could have on inflation. The president can't afford to lose a single Democratic vote in the Senate. So without Manchin, nothing passes, Lindsay. Right. It is all up to him in West Virginia there. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. And when we come back, the deadly train collision that police say may have began when a driver did something at the tracks that everyone is warned not to do. Our journey to the Orkney Islands, where scientists are harnessing the power of waves in what could be a climate change game changer. But up next, could America's second Catholic president be banned tomorrow by bishops from doing a critical church function? what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run with Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. Me the a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. A 
Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Welcome back from Texas to Mississippi, all the way to the Supreme Court. Americans are grappling with new abortion laws and the fate of Roe v. Wade. And tonight, President Biden's stance on abortion has American bishops considering a very public and personal scolding of the first Catholic president since JFK. It's a move that could drive a major wedge between them and the Vatican and insert politics into a very private process. White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks reports. All have left the right path. Catholic bishops from every corner of the country gathering in Baltimore this week to discuss bedrock issues of the church that could also shake American politics. The world watching closely to see if the American bishops will stiff arm the Vatican and publicly go on the record to question President Biden's place in the church. Here we have perhaps the most powerful visible person in the world saying that they both are part of this communion of faith but support the very opposite of its teaching. In June, the Conference of Bishops deciding to draft language that could, in theory, give cover to priests who choose to deny the president and politicians like him communion because of their public support for abortion rights. Biden has said he personally is against abortion, but as a matter of public health, does not think he should impose his view on others. The issue of abortion access creating an extraordinary rift between some American Catholic clergy and the nation's second Catholic president. He supports the utter slaughter of the unborn. What have you done? What have you done to your church? Reports about leaked early versions of the document on communion seem to suggest the bishops may in the end elect to sidestep here. But the debate this week with Biden at the center could be fierce. For months, Biden has tried to downplay the divisions. That's a private matter, and I don't think that's going to happen. Instead, he's leaned into his seemingly close relationship with Pope Francis. The two men often aligned theologically with an emphasis on caring for the poor. Last month, they sat one on one at the Vatican. But I know my son would want me to give this to you. For over an hour, the Vatican releasing video showing several warm moments between the two men. We came up and just talked about the fact that he was happy I was a good Catholic and keep the ABC Cecilia Vega in Rome asked Biden more about the personal meeting. What did it mean for you? to hear Pope Francis in the wake of this, in the middle of this debate, call you a good Catholic? And did what he tell you, should that put this debate to rest? Look, I'm, I'm not gonna, a lot of this is just personal. There's always been this debate in the Catholic Church. Uh, I just find my relationship with him one that I personally take great solace in. He is a really, truly, genuine, decent man. Francis has been crystal clear publicly about his views on abortion, calling it homicide, but recently saying, too, that he has never refused someone the Eucharist, another term for Holy Communion. E cosa deve fare il pastore? Essere pastore. Essere pastore e non andare condannando, non condannando, sì. It's a teaching document. It's Behind the scenes, leaders in Rome have been urging American bishops not to sow divisions. But the bishops insist here that there is need for clarity and understanding on who should be allowed to receive communion. It's people on the way. It's people who are seeking uh, always to be healed of their sins and failings that occur every day. <laughs> who is not supposed to be receiving communion are people who are very publicly, very manifestly persisting in grave sin. A final vote on this church document is expected by the American bishops tomorrow. Mary Alice Parks, ABC the News, Bishop Washington. Uh, Our thanks to Mary Alice. Still ahead here on Prime, hundreds reportedly hospitalized after a storm of scorpions in Egypt. Yes. You heard that right. Our conversation with future NBA Hall of Famer Dwayne Wade about his story, career, and new memoir. And who's in and who's out and who's best positioned to control Congress after the midterms. We take a look by the numbers, but first our post of the day from actress Emma Watson with a pick from 20 years ago around the debut of the first Harry Potter movie. I risk my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. 
But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. 13 siblings held captive by their parents. A survival story like you've never heard. My two little sisters right now chained up. Never before seen. How many kids do you have? 13. 13. Sarge, you got another room in the front right here with two kiddos in the bed. Now, finally, two sisters who saved a family. I don't know how you had the courage. Escape from a house of horror. The only word I know to call it is hell. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. Welcome back, everyone. Now to politics and the once-in-a-decade process that's likely to reshape the 2022 midterms and the next 10 years of House races. We're talking about congressional redistricting, and tonight we take a look at the supercharged gerrymandering that's happening right now by the numbers. Every 10 years, congressional districts are redrawn based on new census data. Republicans dominated the process last decade, and this time around, the GOP controls the line drawing in states with 187 in House seats. That's compared to just 75 seats for the Democrats. 13 states have finalized their redrawn congressional maps for the 2020s, and so far, Democrats will gain five seats nationally, the same number as Republicans. While that's a wash, experts say Republicans are poised to win many more seats through redistricting in the coming weeks. Republicans need a net gain of just five seats to flip the House, and experts now predict that their aggressive gerrymandering could alone guarantee that that happens. While there are already legal challenges to this year's redistricting plans, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 2019 that partisan gerrymandering is a political question that cannot be resolved by federal courts. Nevertheless, 67 percent of Americans say the way that states draw up congressional maps is a, quote, major problem, according to a recent AP poll. And we still have lots to get to here tonight. Jury selection begins for Ghislaine Maxwell, the woman accused of luring minors for disgraced and deceased financier Jeffrey Epstein. We have the latest. And the lawsuit against TikTok that you ought to know about. But first, to look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. From the global resources of ABC News. From morning through daytime, evening, late night, 24 7. The race against time. Climate crisis, saving tomorrow. What can we do now? The groundbreaking reports, all this November on ABC News. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us.
Hello, Wisconsin jury in the Kyle Rittenhouse murder trial is still deliberating after getting the case earlier today. Earlier in court, the teenager was asked to draw juror numbers from this raffle-style box at random. Ultimately, seven women and five men, including one person of color, chosen to deliberate. The six others will serve as alternates. Less than two hours into deliberations, the jury asking for extra copies of their instructions, specifically pages that discuss self-defense and provocation, among other issues. This is a more complicated case than most, than any, frankly, that I can remember. The prosecution looked to portray Rittenhouse as a, quote, wannabe soldier who provoked the crowd by pointing his gun. This is the provocation. This is what starts this incident. You cannot claim self-defense against a danger you create. His lawyers say he killed two people and wounded a third defending himself last year during the unrest in Kenosha. Kyle was not an active shooter. That is a buzzword that the state wants to lash on to. Whenever Kyle was there, he reacted to people attacking him. Three people were killed in a deadly collision on the tracks in Gary, Indiana. Police say the victims were in the car when it was crushed by the freight train. Witnesses say the driver tried to get around the gates and beat the train across the tracks. A new phase of jury selection in the case against Ghislaine Maxwell, who allegedly was Jeffrey Epstein's sex trafficking accomplice. Of the more than 600 prospective jurors who filled out questionnaires, about a third will now be questioned by the judge. The questioning of prospective jurors for the trial of Ghislaine Maxwell began with number seven, a 28-year-old Bronx woman who is pursuing a master's degree in administration and doesn't read the papers. She said she had heard of Jeffrey Epstein, but not Maxwell, who was standing trial on charges she was Epstein's accomplice and groomed minors for his deviant sexual interests. Maxwell has pleaded not guilty and said she committed no crime. It will be after Thanksgiving before the jury is seated. A horde of deadly scorpions are terrorizing Egyptians. Nicknamed Death Stalkers, their venom so dangerous, at least three people reportedly killed and hundreds injured. Heavy rain, flash flooding, dust storms, and even snow. Supposedly to blame for rousing the scorpions, where they've been terrorizing the southern city of Aswan. Health officials even calling in doctors who were vacationing to help treat the surge of injured patients while urging people to stay indoors. Dancing with the Stars judge Derek Huff revealed he's tested positive for COVID. The 36-year-old pro ballroom dancer made the announcement on Instagram. Uh, even though I've been fully vaccinated, I've just been diagnosed with a breakthrough case of COVID. I just found out I'm, I'm currently taking advice from medical professionals, doing everything I can to get better as fast as I can. I'm currently in quarantine, and um, I'll make sure I keep you guys all updated with what's going on. Huff, who's won the Mirrorball Trophy six times, as well as three Emmys for his choreography on the show, says he's feeling okay and strong. Attention, TikTok users, you may be entitled to part of a multi-million dollar settlement from a federal lawsuit. The parent company of TikTok may soon shell out $92 million for improperly harvesting user data. A class action lawsuit claims TikTok illegally collected and used personal data from its users. Now, people who have been using TikTok since before September could be entitled to money from this lawsuit. Welcome back. A small chain of islands in Scotland is hoping to be a big part of the world's push for an all-renewable future and sustainable power grid. In this tiny archipelago, it's about going with the ebb and flow and harnessing one of nature's most powerful forces, water. Our Maggie Ruley reports. The Orkney Islands can feel like a world away. Exposed off the northern tip of Scotland, for millennia they've been constantly battered by Arctic winds and powerful seas. You can just feel the power of nature here, from this wind you see whipping across the island all year long to these massive waves we're watching crash offshore. It's this power that this tiny island chain taps into to become a global leader in developing renewable energy. Today, the waters off these windswept isles have become one of the world's biggest experimental labs for tidal energy, with more turbines tested here on this tiny archipelago than anywhere else in the world. Whoa, we got some movement here. Our boat pulls up alongside Orbital Marine Power's newly built O2 turbine, the most powerful of its kind. Right now, behind us is generating enough power to power 2,000 homes. Yep, as we speak. 
It's the size of a jumbo jet floating on the ocean's surface, anchored to the sea floor by four chains, each weighing more than 300 tons. When we're at peak power at two megawatts, there's as much thrust that goes through the mooring chains as a jumbo jet taking off. We're hanging on tight with Daniel Wise, the ops specialist behind the new turbine. The rough seas bounce us around. We just got a little splash. Um, explain the difference between the waves that we're feeling and the tide, what is actually powering this machine. When you go to the beach and, and you see that all the water's gone and it's low tide, and then a few hours later, all the water's back and that's high tide, it's the movement of water around, uh, around the, the sea. You get wave power technologies and you get tidal power technologies. This is a tidal power technology. But the turbines holding on tight, floating where the Atlantic Ocean meets the North Sea, home to some of the strongest tides in the world. It's incredible. It almost looks like the orbital's moving right now, but really, that's the tide. It is absolutely ripping underneath us. You can almost think of it like a powerful river that changes direction every six hours, four times a day. Just this massive rush of energy that turns those underwater turbines like clockwork. Tidal is one of the only renewable energies that is consistent and reliable, and it's a resource that never runs dry. The source is free, like a bit like wind, but it's entirely predictable, so you know how much power you're going to be ge generating at any specific point in time. The tide is entirely predictable hundreds of years into the future. William Anall grew up on these islands, and he's worked at Orbital Marine for the last decade. We have to site the tidal turbines where there's the most tidal energy, and that's where the flow is moving the fastest. The company's latest device looks like a sci-fi movie in real life, with massive corkscrews twisting underwater. It's kind of like taking a wind turbine, flipping it upside down, and letting the tidal current rotate the blades. As the tide turns, the rotors simply reverse, and that ebb and flow turns into a constant power stream. Well, right now, it doesn't, doesn't look like there's much going on yeah. because all the action is be beneath the surface of the water. We have two large 20-meter oh. diameter rotors that are slowly turning, extracting the energy out of the tide and turning it into electricity. The whole thing can be controlled miles away by these computers back at the office. So that's what's happening here now? Yes. Tidal machines are still relatively new, and more research needs to be done on how they could impact marine ecosystems. But so far, early research shows that there's little immediate danger to wildlife, and the threat to the environment's less than other projects like offshore drilling. In the number of years that we've been, been operating tidal turbines and all the, all the studies that we've done, there's never been a single recorded strike from a marine mammal on a tidal turbine, so it's, so it's a very benign technology. The turbine's been so successful that combined with other renewables, the Orkney Islands now produce more energy than the small population of 20,000 can use, more than 120% of what they need. I think to a degree Orkney is a vision into the future. The real special thing is the predictability of it. Matthew so Finn's the commercial the director for the European Marine Energy Council, headquartered on the islands. And that predictability is great in terms of smoothing out the grid. That's kind of the holy grail of renewables to be that consistent. But he acknowledges that at the current cost of multi-million dollars per machine, it's still too expensive for widespread use. But the main thing is scaling up. And when you scale up, the costs reduce because you're manufacturing more machines, it's cheaper, the supply chain comes into play. Um, so we do see this happening over the next five to 10 years and it becoming competitive um, initially in kind of niche applications um, and then mainstream applications. As the tech advances, so can its impact. Orbital hopes to one day create an array of turbines with multiple machines linked up, similar to a wind farm. And the UK government says there's enough potential in marine energy to meet up to 20% of the UK's current electricity demand. The overall capacity of the industry is, is never going to be as big as, as offshore wind. That, that's a bigger resource. But what we can offer is a predictable energy source um, that, that's a premium product to the, to the grid. And what's created here on the Orkney Islands will be used in tidal currents around the world, including places in the U.S. This tiny island chain betting big on a resource that will never run out, hoping to help the world chart a course towards an all-renewable future. Maggie Ruley, ABC News, the Orkney Islands. Really fascinating stuff. Our thanks to Maggie for that. Dwayne Wade has a lot of titles. The former Miami Heat superstar literally has three championships. But tonight, be beyond his long and accomplished career on the basketball court, his newest title 
is author. He's out today with a new photographic memoir, Dwayne, with photos chronicling his career on and off the court, as well as his family life and the people and moments that helped shape him along the way. We had a chance to speak with Dwayne about his new book and what drives him now that he's no longer playing professional basketball. You start right out and you say confidence is the precursor to dominance. Look, a lot of people are confident, but they're not dominant. So would you say that one of the steps before your confidence is your work ethic? 1,000%. Um, you know, the confidence comes from your work. And so, and I preach this to my son all the time. Um, you know, it's, it's not where you're at now, but it's where you're willing, where you're willing to work to get to. And um, that's for me that through my entire life, basketball was probably the most confident that I've ever been. Um, and it was the only thing that I knew what worked. I knew that hard work worked. And you brought up your kids right away. And also in the book, you talk about how just as much as you're trying to teach them, they're teaching you. What would you say are some of the greatest lessons that you're still learning right now from your kids? Yeah, I, I think that's how it, it should be. Um, I feel like as parents, sometimes we have this this idea that we own our kids. Like it's like we have this, this this sense of ownership over our kids and we're not allowing these little people to become bigger people. As parents, the biggest thing that we've tried to do is we've tried to take the ego of I'm, I'm the parent, I'm the authority out and communicate and actually listen and actually ask questions to these little humans <laughs> uh, who will one day obviously run a family and run this world. And so we want to give them the confidence uh, that they need now um, and don't, you know, and don't save it for later. So in the book, you have this picture next to the label favorite basketball memory. And it wasn't what I was thinking it was going to be because you still have a Marquette jersey on. That is your favorite basketball still from from college days. I mean, I have it's, it's hard, obviously, to pick one moment that is your favorite, especially if you've done some pretty cool things. But for me, it goes back to the beginning of, you know, before you before you became what the world know you as now. That moment that you realized all the hard work and all the things you ever dreamed of, you finally realized that it was possible. Though to me, that 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 becomes the one of my favorite moments. So it goes back to Marquette. It goes back before I had any confidence that I have now, any swagger to do anything. You know, I was that that shy, quiet kid that didn't have that lack of confidence in a lot of areas. And so to be able to gain confidence through sport, uh, it becomes some of my favorite moments, earlier moments than now. How did you go about deciding which photos you were going to use in the book? Uh, three year process. Um, you know, I, I, what I tried to do throughout my career is back in 2010 and 2011, I wanted to start capturing these moments because they were going by so fast. And so I have millions of photos that's behind the scenes that people probably don't want to see or maybe they do. But I really try to go through and pick every photo because of the story that the photo told me. And so the reason I, I didn't just do a book that is just words, I wanted to do a book that is visual. I'm a visual learner. Um, I do everything from a visual standpoint. I just wanted to be able to have my fans and supporters and everyone who, you know, who supports me to be able to visually see the words come to life through photos. You talk about Hank, uh, obviously, and you say that part of uh, what he wanted when you finished, when you walked off the basketball court for the last time, that you would, will have created a legacy. Do you feel like that, that you've established that, you're still working on it? And, and if so, what do you want your legacy to be? I, I definitely think I'm still working on it. I hope I am anyway. Um, but I do believe Hank will be proud of the moment right now. You know, the one thing we cannot do we can't always look towards the end, right? It's like, I live in LA now, it's, everybody know about LA, it's a lot of traffic. So anytime I'm in a car, my, I can't be thinking about getting in the car and then getting to my destination. Look around and enjoy the ride sometime instead of just trying to get to the destination. So um, I've tried to enjoy it throughout this process, um, but I think I'm, I'm building a good legacy for my family, you know, for, for Zaire, for Zaya, for Kyle, for, for my entire family to have a jumping off point as you know, in our community, we start so far behind. And so just giving my family a, ju a jumping off point <laughs> is the biggest legacy that I'll probably be going to be able to live. As a 39-year-old man at this point, with all the confidence, what would you tell that, that young Dwayne who, who really was, was kind of shy and, and, and lacked in the, the confidence? What would you tell him now? What I would tell little Dwayne is don't rush the process. 
go through life, go through all your moments, go through your weird, awkward stages, go through the, 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 the pimple stages, go through all these moments because all these moments are gonna really build and define, you know, the person that you will become, these experiences. So I would just kind of just tell them, just enjoy it, even though it's certain moments where it's gonna suck, find the good in it, find the positive sin in it, find ways that you can come out of it stronger. And again, at this point, being retired and kind of being on the sidelines, so to speak, at this point, what's next? Still a young guy turning 40 only in, in January. Yeah, uh, turning 40. I think, um, you know, what I've tried to accomplish since retiring, I've been retired now. This is going into my third year of retiring. And um, all the things that I wanted to set out to do, I've, I've, I've kind of started it already. I've wanted to see if my personality will work on TV. So I jumped on TNT. I, I host a game show, The Cube. I wanted to further my basketball excitement and, and rise. And so I got into the ownership with the Utah Jazz. These are all these things that I've been trying to build. I have my own wine company and I'm really invested in it. I have a board seat at UC Davis. I'm trying to bring more diversity to this space. So I'm working on a lot of different things and it's all exciting for me, but it's all new. And so I'm starting from the bottom in a sense and I'm in my early stages. I'm in my rookie year again. So Zaire, seeing him on the basketball court, how are you as, are you dad the coach? Or are you more hands off? What do you, how are you in that space? Well, now it's, it's different. I think it, you go through phases, um, you know, especially Zaire playing the same sport that I play, right? All the things that come with that. I'm in a space where, you know, my son is open to the information that, that I got, that I've gotten for the last 39 years of my life and 16 plus years in the NBA and beyond in basketball. Sometimes he needs me to, to pat him on the shoulder a little bit and, and understand that it's hard. Sometimes you need me to, to hit him with the fatherly advice and, and say that, you know, that's the wrong mentality. This is the way we need to think, like all these different things. So I'm trying to, to give and, and, and I feel like I'm doing my most parenting while my son is 19 than I did any other place in his mm -hmm. life um, because this is important for him. He wants to get it right. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and, and sharing the book with us. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, the hug nearly six months in the making. Danny Fenster pictured embracing his mother after arriving at JFK Airport. He was abruptly freed 24 hours ago after an 11-year sentence for hard labor. Fortunately, he didn't have to finish that 11 years. He was a journalist who was jailed following the military coup in Myanmar earlier this year. Fenster thanked everyone who helped secure his release. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Over the next hour, our conversation with Lady Gaga from presidential inaugurations to now her hotly anticipated new movie, House of Gucci, and the ABC News exclusive with the mother of an 11 year old girl who was the sole survivor of a plane crash that killed her husband. How does one find the strength to keep going after something so horrific? what being live is Please all Maggie, about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. We will look at what has been happening this week. And we'll talk about it later on the roundtable. Good morning and welcome to this week. Good morning and welcome to this week. Good morning and welcome to this week. Historic. Join us Sunday morning celebrating 40 years of ABC's This Week. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. 
13 siblings held captive by their parents. A survival story like you've never heard. My two little sisters right now chained up. Never before seen. How many kids do you have? 13. Sarge, you got another room in the front right here with two kiddos in the bed. Now, finally, two sisters who saved a family. I don't know how you had the courage. Escape from a house of horror. The only word I know to call it is hell. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. ABC News. Honored. Winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards. More than any other network. Including winning for the third straight year the award for overall excellence in television. ABC News is America's number one news source. When that man focuses his attention on you, the world stops. That's really flattering, because you're beautiful. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. President Biden has hit the road to sell his newly signed $1 trillion infrastructure law. His first stop, a rusted bridge in New Hampshire. His team is planning more than a thousand events across the country over the next six weeks to try to convince Americans just how much the law will benefit communities across the country. Megastore Costco has issued a recall for specific packages of Kool-Aid believed to have small pieces of metal or glass in them. They warned customers to return the 82 and a half ounce size of the tropical punch flavor featuring a certain use by date on the container. Customers will receive a full refund. It is day eight in the trial of the three men accused of killing Ahmad Arbery. The state of Georgia officially rested its case this evening. This comes after a dramatic day in court with the medical examiner revealing graphic images from Aubrey's autopsy and testimony from a series of FBI agents who detailed the chase leading to Aubrey's death. Now the defense will get their turn to present arguments when court resumes tomorrow. Now to the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, now in the hands of the jury. Twelve individuals, only one of whom is a person of color, will decide if Rittenhouse acted in self-defense when he fired on three people, killing two of them during protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Late today, the judge sent jurors home. After eight and a half hours of deliberations, a verdict could come as soon as tomorrow. Here's ABC's Terry Moran. In the courtroom in Kenosha today, a striking moment. Kyle Rittenhouse facing life in prison if he's convicted on the most serious charge, drawing the numbers himself at random, determining which of the 18 jurors who watched the entire trial will decide his fate. Number nine and number 52. In the end, those jurors, seven women and five men. One of the 12 is a person of color. Rittenhouse faces five felony charges from first degree intentional homicide, the most serious charge, to reckless endangerment. So the jury must look at each of the three shootings, two of them deadly, Rittenhouse committed that night last year. Each one captured on videotape and testified to by witnesses. I thought that the defendant was um, an active shooter. This case carrying unmistakable political overtones, those protests sparked by a police shooting and the defense clearly trying to put the protesters themselves on trial. The rioters, the demonstrators who turned into rioters, those are the individuals who bring us forth. They were pushing, firing dumpsters, destroying property. Everything this community went through, the only person who shot and killed anyone was the defendant. Yes, there was property damage. No one's here to defend that. You cannot claim self-defense against a danger you create. This small city still traumatized by that night. The local sheriff today issuing a statement saying he sees no reason for curfews or road closures and Wisconsin's governor urging people to remain peaceful. Our thanks to Terry Moran. Now to the latest on COVID-19. More states are starting to move ahead of the federal government and urge anyone over the age of 18 to get a booster shot as cases increase in parts of the country. Meanwhile, a government official confirms to ABC News today that the FDA may issue new guidance as soon as this week on Pfizer Moderna boosters for anyone 18 and older. ABC's Morgan Norwood has more. 
As the U.S. looks to thwart a potential holiday surge of COVID-19, more states are moving ahead of the federal government, allowing all vaccinated adults to get a booster shot. If you're in doubt, get the darn booster. Thanksgiving is bearing down on us here. New York, New Jersey, and Arkansas joining the four other states now offering widespread booster access, no longer waiting for the FDA or CDC to sign off. It comes amid alarming numbers. 21 states seeing hospitalizations climb upwards of 10 percent in the past week. Six hospitals in New Mexico reinstating crisis standards of care to deal with the influx of COVID patients. And frontline workers in Colorado also feeling the strain. If you haven't uh, gotten vaccinated or you haven't gotten your third shot, uh, please reconsider. Go do it. We need a break. The pressure to get more people vaccinated met with pushback in California. These parents rallying against the state's vaccine mandate in schools determined to be the decision makers for their children. In Northern California, a handful of parents say their kids are now sick due to a mistake. The children given the adult dose of Pfizer's vaccine double the dosage they should have received. They absolutely, absolutely failed my children and the other 12 children involved. Pfizer's vaccine doses for kids are labeled with an orange cap. The chair of the clinic saying they're reviewing their processes to make sure this doesn't happen again. Meantime, health experts say the children should recover just fine. Headache. Uh, muscle aches, um, fever in some cases, chills, but they should go away in a day or two. And back to the push for boosters, Pfizer has already asked the FDA to authorize its boosters for all adults who previously received the Pfizer vaccine. The company is also asking federal regulators to approve its new antiviral COVID pill Pfizer says is effective at reducing hospitalizations. Lindsay? Morgan, thank you. Entire towns underwater and hundreds of people forced from their homes. That's the fallout after an atmospheric river hammered Washington and the Pacific Northwest. In some areas, a foot and a half of rain. Several rivers at major flood stage tonight, and the storm continues to dump rain as it moves east. ABC's Will Carr reports. Tonight, hundreds of families are out of their homes and at least one person is missing. Nearly a foot and a half of rain pummeling parts of Washington state over several days. North of Seattle and Samas, a race to rescue hundreds after the Nooksack River jumped its banks. It's pitch black, the wind's blowing. I mean, I have a 20 foot boat and that current was, you know, yarding it into the telephone poles and stuff like that. Coast Guard helicopters dropping baskets, rescuing a baby and nine more people near the town of Forks. And ever since, Stephanie Vigil and Eric Walker so trapped bad. in their home oh, with their the dogs. You can do it. Let's go. Come Standing on their furniture, pleading for help, finally rescued through their window by heavy equipment. We finally got it out, guys. Ever since, police still searching for a man swept away on Main Street Monday. Storms fueled by 82 mile an hour wind gusts toppling huge trees. Landslides blocking major Interstate 5. Those high winds now fueling wildfires in Colorado. Back here in Washington State, those winds have died down, but we're still in a major flood stage, and you can see those sandbags. We're expecting more rain later this week. Lindsay. Hopefully those sandbags will do the trick. Will, thank you. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z joins us now. Ginger, where's the storm right now? Well, it is right in the middle of the nation. So that cold front still so powerful. We've seen gusts upwards of 74 miles per hour in North Dakota, but it stretches all the way down through the Rockies and into even New Mexico. So Albuquerque had their second day of record high temperatures, but also the wind gusts in the some of those red flag warnings up to 55 miles per hour. And yes, there's warmth ahead of that, but boy, we wish uh, in those areas that it came with a little bit of moisture. And, and Ginger, we know so much of the West has been dealing with this unrelenting mega drought. Ha has there been any improvement with the recent storms? <laughs> Well, there has been some. It's come far too quickly for a lot of folks, as we just saw in some of those images. But I want to take you to the map because this really helps to kind of detail and emphasize what's happened. More than 16 inches of rain in just five days in the areas that you can see targeted there in the northwestern Washington state. That is not the area that needed the rain. If you look at the drought monitor, where they really need it would be in southeastern Washington state. Now look across California, which still has close to 80% in that second highest level of drought. Nevada, big problems in Montana, and still in parts of Utah. So no, the drought certainly hasn't been eradicated, and the rain just keeps falling in the places that already have it.
And, and while many might really like the warmer fall temperatures, I understand an unseasonably warm fall is actually affecting the ski season. So Steamboat Springs just announced today that they will be delaying the start of their season. This is the first time they've done it since 2016. Meanwhile, in the Sierra, because we have had those atmospheric rivers, there are some places opening early. So, so for some people that kind of like Hawaiian or Pineapple Express has worked out and for others like in Colorado, it will be delayed. Got it. All right, Ginger Z, thank you so much as always. Now to an ABC News exclusive. The mother of an 11-year-old girl who was the sole survivor of a plane crash that killed her husband discusses how her daughter is recovering and recalls the moment that she saw her daughter for the first time after the crash. ABC's Gio Benito has their, Benitez has their story. She's a woman caught between a tragedy and a miracle. Christy Perdue opening up from outside the hospital where her 11-year-old daughter Lainey is recovering. The sole survivor of a plane crash that claimed the life of her father and three others. Christy, first tell us, how is Lainey doing? Um, she has a long road ahead of her. She has five broken bones sort of all over in random places. and um, But she is amazing and she's inspiring us all. And so but with that smile, there are tears. Saturday afternoon, Lainey and her father Mike were on a commuter plane, which takes people on and off Beaver Island in Michigan, when it crashed. Christy believes her husband, who was known for his warm hugs, may have saved their daughter's life. Lainey told me in the hospital that her last memory is that dad just grabbed her and held her really, really tight. In my heart, I know that um, it protected her. Christy says Lainey has injuries only on one side of her body. The side where he was hugging her and holding her, that's where she was protected. I believe that it would make sense to me that if her injuries were on the one side, that her other side was with her dad and he was holding her. A Coast Guard helicopter was in the air for training around the time of the crash. They heard the alert and spotted the debris. The helicopter airlifted Lainey to the hospital. What was that like, that moment when you were able to hold your daughter after all of this? I ran into the hospital because you don't know, they don't tell you anything, you know, and um, I didn't know if there was burns or, or if she hit her head or she was going to walk. And then she just said, hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. And so I just knew at that moment that that part was going to be okay. The Beaver Island community holding a candlelight vigil for those who did not survive. Now, despite the crash, Christy says she and Lainey will get on those commuter planes again. We will fly again and we will be there and we will be home again. He would want us all to just share his memory, but make sure his babies were good. So touching our thanks to Gio and switching gears now we move to Lady Gaga. The pop superstar has had an eventful year including performing at President Biden's inauguration. Now her upcoming role in House of Gucci is generating generating a lot of buzz. ABC's Michael Strahan sat down with Lady Gaga to discuss her latest role and the past year. It was a name that sounded so sweet. Lady Gaga is stunning audiences once again. They had it all. Worth style, power. Who wouldn't care for that? In the highly anticipated House of Gucci, starring as Patrizia Reggiani. I subscribe to unconventional punishments. The then heiress to the fashion empire. Well, at least it's my name on the mugs, not yours. Our name, sweetie. The movie's not even out yet, but you're getting Best Actress Oscar buzz. So how does that feel? It's wonderful to be in the Oscars conversation. And also, by nature, I'm more competitive with myself than I am with other people. But I feel really blessed and very honored to be in this movie. The electric love story between Maurizio Gucci and Patrizia quickly turned into a tale of jealousy, revenge, and even murder. There was a lot that was in the media that was sensationalized about how she was this gold digger and about how she killed for greed and money. I believe it was love, and I believe it was survival. I saw what you said, this is not an imitation, it's a becoming. Yeah. I spent six months working on her accent. Father, son, and house of Gucci. I spent a lot of time talking this way, just as Stephanie, myself. Then I did all the research on who she was as a person, but I, I didn't want to meet her because 
I could tell very quickly that this woman wanted to be glorified for this murder, and she wanted to be remembered as this criminal. So you've never met her? No, I didn't want to collude with something that I don't believe in. You know, she did have her husband murdered. This proud Italian-American hopes her role makes her family and Italians proud. It's time to take out the trash. Aldo and Paolo, they're poison. They're an embarrassment to this company, and everybody knows it. I was just in Milan the other day doing a television show, and when he told me that he was so impressed with my accent and that Italian people were impressed with my accent, I, I couldn't think of a higher honor. Lady Gaga is an unstoppable force and has had quite a year, starting with her performing at President Biden's inauguration. That was a real honor. And I have a lot of complicated feelings about this country. I think the whole country felt complicated. We still have to figure out how to do this together. And, and is it true that you wore a bulletproof dress? Yeah. In some ways, it was the safest place in the world, and in other ways, it seemed like the most dangerous. I just wanted to be prepared. You released your sixth studio album, Chromatica, last year. But you, you said that you wrote it while you were going through a very hard time physically and emotionally. When I made it, I was like pushing myself to write music because I was really sad. I didn't even want to create. And I think that that, as a performer, is a real signal that something's off. So Chromatica, for me, was a way that I danced through all my pain. And I know um, you had the, the incident with your dog. We are back with the investigation into the shooting of Lady Gaga's dog walker. The suspects also stole two of Gaga's French bulldogs. And I'm just curious, coming through that, did that change the way that you look at life? In addition to being so grateful that my dogs are alive, uh, I am so grateful that my friend Ryan Fisher is alive. The fact that he was shot was so outrageous and painful, and I pray for his healing all the time. And it also reminds me that in a lot of ways, I have it really, really good. And I need to stay grounded in that gratitude. But before we end it, a little lightning round. What's your biggest strength? I think my heart. What's the best thing that's happened to you this year? Love. I love love. I love love, too. You're smiling. Yeah. I think relationships are really important. Realness is one of the best things that happened to me this year. You got to find the one you can just be who you are. And for what's next on our bucket list, well, what's left? But change the world, of course. I'd like to spend the next decades of my life learning how to mobilize myself and the, those who are watching to build a kinder and braver world. We all love love, don't we? Our thanks to Michael Strahan and Lady Gaga for that. And still to come, the bomb blast that rocked the capital in Africa, plus our conversation with the man elected mayor of one California town when he was just 26 years old. His remarkable story when we come back. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. For the first time, a survival story like you've never seen. Hello? This is 911. Do you have an emergency? I just want to leave from home because I don't see the family is 15 and we have abusing parents. Now, finally hear from the family. My whole body was shaking. I couldn't really dial 911 because... I'm sorry. I don't know how you had the courage. I think it was like us coming so close to death so many times. It was literally a now or never. If something happened to me, at least I died trying. 
never before seen. My two little sisters right now chained up. Where are they chained up at? On the bed. What are your parents going to do when they find out you left? They're going to want someone to kill them. No weapons in the house. I do have guns. It's locked up. How many kids do you have? 13. 13. Sarge, you got another room in the front right here with two kiddos in the bed. Stop me dead in my tracks. Starved, beaten, tied up. What do you know about why these two people did this to their children? 13 times over. There are cases that stick with you, that haunt you, and that's what we're looking at here. Every day did you wake up in terror? Sometimes people were chained for, what, months? Yeah. Months? Yeah. Unbearable. Yeah. Mother, she choked me, and I thought I was going to die. The only word I know to call it is hell. And what has happened since? People couldn't believe this. The public deserves to know. Staggering strength, courage, and the will to survive. The escape from horror. My parents took my whole life from me, but now I'm taking my life back. Oh my gosh, this is so free. Like, this is life. I want Turpinine. Like, wow, they're strong. They're not broken. They've got this. Escape from a House of Horror, a Diane Sawyer special event, this Friday night on ABC. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. We are tracking several headlines from around the world. Two explosions ripped through Uganda's capital today, killing at least three civilians and three suicide bombers. Dozens of people were injured in the bombings. The Allied Democratic Forces, a group affiliated with the Islamic State group, claimed responsibility for the attack. Uganda has been rocked by a string of bombings in recent weeks. Earlier today, Polish forces unleashed water cannons at stone-throwing migrants who have been trying to cross from Belarus into Poland. It shows an increase in tension on the European Union's eastern border, where Western leaders have accused Belarus of using the migrants to destabilize the EU. Some 2,000 migrants are currently camped out along the border amid freezing temperatures. Posting on Twitter today, Naomi Osaka joined the growing movement demanding information on the whereabouts of Chinese tennis star Peng Shui. She's won double tennis titles at Wimbledon and the French Open and has not been seen in public since she posted a message on Chinese social media on November 2nd, accusing a former Chinese vice premier of sexual assault. Next up, we bring in former Stockton, California Mayor Michael Tubbs. His life has truly been extraordinary. At just 26 years old, he became the first black mayor of Stockton and the youngest mayor of any major city in American history. In his new memoir, The Deeper the Roots, he writes about growing up poor, raised by his young mother after his father was in prison for kidnapping, robbery, and a drug violation. And yet, he still overcame the odds against him. Thank you so much for being here, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. So you're 31 now, but actually decided you're going to start writing a memoir when you were 27. Normally, people kind of <laughs> wait till midlife, toward the end of their life, to decide. Why did you decide so young that now's the time to do my memoir? Well, after I won my election, so many people reached out and said, you have to write about this story. Mm -hmm. And I remember growing up and reading, like, Black Boy by Richard Wright, yeah. which really talks about his childhood, or it makes me want to holler by Nathan right? McCall and realize that there was something very particular about how I grew up and also being a mayor at a time when Trump was president that I wanted to capture while I knew while I my memory was fresh sure. and where it would be raw and unfiltered and as idealistic and as dumb as a 27, 28, 29-year-old can be. I mean, that's the book we have before us. And, and you write about how your anger propelled you forward. How were you able to channel that emotion in such a su successful way? Yeah, I, I think rage at injustice is justifiable, but it's necessary and not sufficient. So I thought there was like two choices. I could be nihilistic and, and take that rage inward and be upset and be self-destructive, 
I can be really clear about what I'm mad about and spend all my energy around fighting injustice, creating opportunity, and trying to make it different so that kids don't have to grow up with fathers in prison, so that kids don't have to grow up in poverty. And that anger is what really drives the work. At just 22 years old, you were able to garner national attention. Even people like Oprah Winfrey were following your story. What do you think drew people in? And uh, not just because they were interested in your story, but actually to vote for you in, into public office, even before you became mayor in city council. I think it was sort of just the place. Like when I ran for city council, Stockton was the largest city to declare bankruptcy. And to have this kid who was at Stanford who entered in the White House to say, I'm going to go back and try to fix it, I think gave people hope. Mm -hmm. I think for some people it was a novelty, and for some people they didn't think it would happen. But I think for a lot of people it's like, well, this is something different. Why, why not try? We know the status quo isn't working, and I think the time as a city council person was spent building relationships, gaining experience, so that when I became mayor, I was actually able to deliver and do things that are now becoming national models. What are you most proud of that you were able to achieve while you were mayor of Stockton? I'm incredibly proud of the Stockton Scholars Program. It's a scholarship program I started where every single Stockton student for the next decade is guaranteed a four-year, two-year, or trade school scholarship. But also, of course, proud of the basic income work and also very proud of the fact we reduced homicides by 40% in 2018 and 2019. There are a lot of theories about why you weren't reelected. What do you think is chief among them? Chief is, th like, this information, this idea of sort of alternative realities is real. And while we were spending four years governing and trying to do things, there was a four-year disinformation campaign using the algorithm. And also, when you're the first or the youngest, it's not because you're better than everyone else like you. That means there's some institutional bias there. So I think because of racism, because of the climate we're in, some of the lies about me being a crook, mm -hmm. some of the lies about me stealing money, some of the lies about me being lazy, all anti-black black tropes really resonate with people because, I mean, Stockton's beautiful, but it's tough. We were doing hard work and things were getting better, but when the baseline's the, the floor, even if you're one or two floors above, it still feels like progress is not happening enough. So it was a perfect storm of things, but disinformation, absolutely. Feels like this is a new season for you. You've just relocated, have a new baby. What's next for you? It feels like there are many chapters still ahead. Yeah, I'm resolute in my belief that we shouldn't have poverty. So I'm starting an initiative called End Poverty in California to focus on that. Still working with mayors on their guaranteed income programs. I'm doing a lot of in storytelling, so maybe a podcast, things of that sort, and just really focus on how do we create a country that we deserve to live in, where everyone has opportunity and when stories like mine aren't anomalies, but they're given because we actually give people the resources and the investments to reach their full potential. Anybody who picks up your book, what do you hope that they take away? I hope they take away this fa the fact that mentorship matters, that, 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 that love of adults really matters, and that it's not enough to talk about roses who grow from concrete, but we have to really interrogate why we want roses to grow from concrete in the first place. Let's plant children in environments with rich soil and nutrients, and we'll be amazed at how they blossom and how they contribute to our world. Bloom, where you're planted. I thank you so much for talking with us. Congratulations on the book, Michael Tubbs, The Deeper the Roots. It is now available wherever books are sold. And finally, thousands are getting ready to take to the streets of Philadelphia this weekend for the Philadelphia Marathon. And this year, one elite runner is getting ready for her final race and redefining what it means to leave it all out there. Reporter Jamie Apodi from our friends at WPBI in Philadelphia has her story. In the sea of thousands of runners at the Philadelphia Marathon this weekend will be one who is not running at all. Being pushed in a special cart will be a first for longtime elite runner and triathlete Diane Barbarian. But what makes this marathon special for her is that it will also be her last. I have a tattoo. It says she believed she could, so she did. That's my, my line. So we have shirts now that they all wear. On the back, it, the finish line is. And when she couldn't, we pushed her to the finish line. The finish line, that's both figurative and literal. You see, Diane is dying of cancer. The doctor told me when she gave me the death sentence to um, get out your bucket list. I said to her, I know you don't know me, but I've lived a bucket list. His racing has taken this Ben Salem native all over the globe. And since being given one month to live one year ago, Diane is living it up. She's had a day named after her in the city of Boston, where she's run so many Boston marathons. Threw out the first pitch at Fenway Park. And this Thursday, we'll drop the first puck at the Flyers game. But mostly, it's about making memories with those she loves most and those who love her. <laughs> yes, I do know I'm dying. 
I know that my body is breaking down. My, my mind is changing a little bit, but I'm not done. So this weekend, Diane will be pushed by a team of 20 friends and family working in shifts for a half marathon and an 8K on Saturday and 26.2 more miles on Sunday. Why do you need to do the Philly Marathon this weekend? It's me leaving, I say my own ashes, but my energy, my spirit, I'm leaving it on the streets of Philadelphia for everybody. Everybody that runs the streets of Philadelphia now will have Diane Barbarian with them. And as Diane is dying, she's showing us all how to live. Our thanks to Jamie for that. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.